Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to the fifth monthly clinical meeting of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Today's meeting is held in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists, and it is themed under Lung Voyage on Bronchiectasis. I would like to invite the president of the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists, Dr. Niranjan Disanayake, and the speakers for today, Dr. Ishant Pereira, consultant respiratory physician at National Hospital of Respiratory Diseases, Valisara, Dr. Hiruni Nimesha, senior registrar in respiratory medicine at National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases, Valisara, and Dr. Kalana Jayavira, senior registrar in respiratory medicine at National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases, Valisara, to the head table. To formally commence, I cordially invite Dr. Niranjan Disanayake, President, Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists, to speak a few words. Um, good afternoon, and uh, it is indeed a pleasure to uh, be here for the uh, monthly clinical meeting between the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. And uh, we are discussing a very interesting topic today uh, about bronchiectasis. And it is a very common lung disease, a chronic lung disease that we deal in our day-to-day -day practice uh, in Sri Lanka. So uh, I think most of the information that will be shared uh, by our two senior registrars, Dr. Hiruni Nimesha and Dr. Kalan Jayavira, uh, regarding the cases that they present and the uh, expert discussion by Dr. Shant Pereira, our senior consultant uh, respiratory physician at uh, National Hospital of Respiratory Diseases, Valisara, will shed light to this very important uh, disease and how it is being managed and how we can improve our patient's outcome by in increasing our knowledge base on bronchiectasis. And without much ado, I would like to uh, continue the meeting. And uh, yeah, shall I invite, I think Dr. Hiruni will be doing the first case presentations. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Hiruni Nimesha. And then he, she will be followed by Dr. Kalana Jayavira. And then uh, Dr. Shant Pereira will be discussing about the disease uh, as a whole. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, today we will have a look on lung voyage and bronchiectasis, uh, one of the very commonest uh, diseases in Sri Lanka, if I may say. But at the same time, And at the same time, sometimes mismanaged, and uh, there are a lot of complications due to that. So in our talk, we'll first uh, listen to case presentations where there are there are there's two different presentations of bronchiectasis. And then following that, we'll have an interesting quiz that you can actively join. And then we'll have an expert opinion on bronchiectasis. So the first case presentation, uh, this is about a 15-year-old boy who presented to us with three days history of shortness of breath and fever. So in the background, he was diagnosed with bronchiectasis at the age of 10. So this was the admission chest extra. You can fairly see bilateral lower lobe predominant bronchiectasis changes. Together with that, some left upper lobe bullet and some inflammatory changes. So this was the uh, chest extra that we took when the patient presented at the age of 15. 
So in the history, this is a child of consanguineous marriage. Patient, uh, parents were 29 years old when they had the ch child, and he already had a five-year-old healthy sister. So the, patient, uh, the boy was delivered at term with normal vaginal delivery with no complications. And the, there were no neonatal complications and birth weight was 2.5, uh, 2.8 kilograms. And the problem starts when he was seven months of age, where the patient was presenting with recurrent respiratory tract infections and episodically the chest X-ray also showed some consolidations. So in first time, at the age of one and a half years, in 2008, he's present into a hospital with cough and fever and runny nose at three days duration with features of lower respiratory tract infections. And on admission, he had bilateral crepitations in lungs and the chest X-ray already showed but inflammatory shadows. So in that admission, uh, his full blood count was uh, WBC 8.5 with neutrophilic predominance. But uh, interestingly, he had HB of 7.7 .7, and platelet was normal. Blood picture came as possible bacterial infections and uh, to exclude any uh, thalassemia at present. So he was investigated with an HPLC, which was again normal, with excluding beta thalassemia. And CRP at that time was high, 123 with normal ESR and obviously test X-ray showed bilateral inflammatory shadowing. The episode was straightforward. He was managed as bronchopneumonia and 14 days of antibiotics was continued and the sputum cultures were negative at that time. And he was discharged with follow-up. Uh, and importantly, this was the first presentation to the hospital. In, even though the patient had recurrent infection history in the background, the outpatient chest physiotherapy was not initiated at this point. Now, after discharge, the patient is presenting with the episodic chronic cough and sometimes runny nose in the morning. And from the out, uh, out sector, he was initial diagnosis possible asthma and was started on inhaler, serotide, 125 and 25 inhalers. But despite that, the patient was having symptomatic, uh, the patient was not improving symptomatically. So when we go into the background, uh, even though the patient's weight was okay at birth, thereafter he was having poor weight gain. And the weight was almost every time is less than third uh, centile. And he was also having short stature. But several times he um, his mother has complained of steatoria, but the stool fat levels were normal all the time. And interestingly, he had absent BCG scar at the presentation as well. And he was having this delayed bone age, which was so severe that at five years of age, his bone age was two years. And he's short for age, and he significantly had failure to thrive. With that, they had taken endocrine opinion, but the basic hormone profile, TSH, testosterone, everything was normal. So what's happening? So despite, uh, despite the episodic management, after the first presentation at one and a half years of age, he was having his second presentation when he was five years of age, which is again uh, with features of lower respiratory tract infection and was managed as pneumonia. At that time, CRP was 20. Uh, ESR was also normal, but the mount 2 text was negative. It's more or less like a vi viral infection. This time, they had perform HRCT, which showed right middle lobe and left lingual lobe consolidations. And no features of bronchiectasis was there at five years of age, and there were no congenital abnormalities. Because of this history of recurrent infections, here he was started on prophylactic antibiotics, azithromycin. And uh, even at this point, apparently the chest physiotherapy was not initiated. And uh, the patient's acute stage was managed and sent home, but the patient was having a recurrent chest infection despite. So unfortunately, at the age of 10, this patient was diagnosing with bronchiectasis. The charge CT showed bronchiectasis involving posterior segment of right upper lobe, middle lobe, lingual lobe, and left lobe lobe. You can see the extensive involvement of the bronchiectasis. And with recurrent respiratory tract infections, some of his sputum culture is now showing pseudomonas in, uh, infections as well. So the baseline testing was uh, initially after the diagnosing of bronchiectasis, ESR, CRSV of the UK, 
and the phycultures were negative at that time. And echo, except from Ixomat as well, there were no significant pulmonary hypertension. The ejection fraction was okay. Right. And ultrasound scan, there were no evidence of cirrhosis and no significant other abnormalities found. So we can see that we have arranged the IgA, IgG, and IgM levels, immunomarkers as well, which were normal. And sweat test was negative, retroviral studies, and C3 levels were also within normal range. So a uh, neutrophil functional testing was also done, and 96% of neutrophils were showing normal function. And lymphocyte subset testing, T cells, B cells, NK cells, all were within normal range. So uh, after the, this, uh, the patient is presenting with uh, three days history of cough and fever to us, where we had managed with uh, intravenous antibiotics where the patient had high CRP and ESR and after 10 days of admission, he was discharged. So what is the problem as associated with this case? So a patient presenting a normal child, normal delivered patient presenting with seven, with recurrent infection at seventh uh, month of his age and ultimately diagnosing his bronchiectasis at the age of 10. So what is actually the cause of this disease? Was the infection that he had was primary or whether it was secondary? Whether there was some problem related to the consanguinity that their uh, parents were having? Or whether this is because of recurrent viral infections that is very common in children, which has the potency to cause in bronchiectasis, like woofing, cough, measles, and other possible bacterial infections. And the patient had failure to try or did he had associated pulmonary development problem as well, so that he is very susceptible to recurrent infection. So the cause of an bronchiectasis was not properly identified, and some treatment deficiencies and management problems. So most of the time, the proper follow up was not arranged with the proper physiotherapy and all. And sampling problems are there. Obviously, he was a small child. Uh, the sputum production, uh, sputum collection, must have been difficult. And none of the times he had undergone bron uh, bronchoscopic uh, investigations, probably because the uh, difficulties in doing bronchoscopies in children. So these are the lack of problems that we can see with this case. So we'll move on to the second case, where we have a 26-year-old patient. And uh, at the age of seven years, she has presented with left upper lobe pneumonia. And uh, after that, the, after the episode was managed, he had recurrent, she had recurrent respiratory tract infections. But uh, not like uh, the first case, she had no complications in neonatal life, no uh, adolescence problems, no recurrent chi in childhood infections. But because of this, uh, but later, uh, he, she was diagnosed with upper lobe bronchiectasis after several years. And at the age of 17 years, she has undergone atypical vet exploration to actually look for the cause, but no pathology was found. The, as obvious, initial management was made, sputum cultures and gene expert was repeated sent, which was negative, which is the most common uh, cause for upper lobe uh, infections and bronchiectasis in this part of the world. And uh, recurrent pyogenic cultures were positive with various bacterial infections, including pseudomonas, which is the bane of bronchiectasis. And uh, she was treated with intravenous antibiotics. And HRCT showed only upper lobe localized disease with no cause. This shows the HRCT film. You can see in third row significant left upper lobe bronchiectasis, which is not there in the lower lobes. Let's say, uh, single view, again showing left upper lobe bronchiectasis, and this was not there in the lower lobes. So what happened to her? After diagnosing, she presented with recurrent episodes of hemoptysis. In 2025, she had to undergo a BA to control the uh, hemoptysis. And not like our first case, being adult, she has underwent several bronchoscopies, and most of these bronchoscopic findings are positive with uh, galactamanan and serum galactamanan was also positive. It, she was had undergone voriconazole treatment without significant improvement of her disease activity. And in 2023, with the recurrent infective exacerbations and hemoptysis, she lay, lastly underwent vet surgeries for upper lobectomy. And after surgery, there was some reduction in her hemoptysis episodes. 
but not complete reduction was there. And the uh, histological evidence came as microbacterial tuberculosis positivity, and she was commenced on ATD treatment. And after anti-TB treatment, uh, she had some remarkable recovery, but episodic, she had exacerbations and uh, some hemoptysis. So lay, because of this, the patient was uh, referred for the evaluation. So this is the chest X-ray when she presented to us. You can see the obvious volume reduction in the left carpal lobe some, with some fibrotic changes. So is this enough? So this patient presenting with bronchiectasis found to have upper lobe localized disease and ultimately positive uh, TB culture positivity. And can we say this is straightforward uh, post-TB bronchiectasis or the bronchi something wrong with the upper lobe and possibly uh, TB causing bronchiectasis? So we'll see. Uh, the basic investigation we have also started. The fungal cultures were sent, then some fil fungal filaments were seen. Serum IgG aspergill specific antibodies were not seen and gene expert TB cultures were at that time negative. And neutrophil functional test was normal. Complement C3, C4 levels were normal. And interestingly, you can see she had very low IgA levels with normal IgG and IgM levels. So what is the connection? So according to the experts and recently having uh, research articles, that significant, there's no direct cause of bronchiectasis causing by IgA deficiencies. But a patient who has significant IgA deficiency can alter the disease progression and complication and treatment. So what is the important thing in evaluating this sort of patient? So proper investigations is in whenever possible scenarios is needed to properly evaluate these patients with bronchial disease, not just infections, not just another disease. And obviously, the surgical options are available for localized disease, and you have to be vigilant when to refer and obviously the correct management. So next we'll move on to the interesting quiz to see how much of bronchiectasis basic knowledge you have. So we'll pass over to Dr. Kalna Jayavi. Okay, uh, good afternoon dear sir uh, and colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for Hiruni for that excellent presentation. So now I'm going to do the uh, quiz uh, to refresh your knowledge and assess your existing knowledge on uh, bronchiectasis. Uh, actually, as for the, this quiz, so you also can take a part. Uh, there is a small QR code in front of you. You can sc scan that QR code from your phone. And uh, so the questions are very easy. Don't worry. But the important thing is there are best, uh, 12 best of five questions. Um, you have to answer as quick as possible because I'm giving limited time. The time uh, duration usually it is 15 seconds to 30 seconds, depending on the length of the uh, question. Uh, okay, shall we start? Uh, right. Okay. So, so this is the QR code. I think uh, the online participants also, if you like, so they can also can scan the QR code and uh, log into the quiz. The first question, so what contributes to the development of bronchiectasis? Okay. Now you have to answer. No, sorry. Sorry, still not, this is not in the presentation mode. Uh, Just give me a second, so there are some technical issues. Right, okay, now it's going to play, okay? So I'll start with the first question. 
So, uh, so this is the first question. You are having only 15 seconds. Okay, just answer. What factors contributed to the development of bronchiectasis? There are three participants in the quiz. So others also, if they like, so they can join. So the correct answer is all of the above causes can cause uh, the bronchi bronchiectasis. Okay. So this is the scoreboard. Uh, so Deshan is on the top. Okay, shall we move to the, I'm not going to discuss the much of the, uh, his, uh, the pathophysiology because there is an interesting topic, interesting lecture is coming on after this quiz. So the so induction of bronchiectasis usually require uh, two factors. Usually there is the infectious insult and impaired drainage or defect in the host defense system. So these are the etiological factors for a bronchiectasis. There are a whole lot of list. So this is the next question. Okay, get ready. So this is the second one. Which statement about bronchiectasis is incorrect? It doesn't matter. You can give your answers because the interesting part coming after the quiz. I'm asking the incorrect answer. What is incorrect? Okay, the time is up. The 29 has voted as the bronchiectasis is among, among male. The correct answer is that it, uh, bronchiectasis is more common among females. There is an association with low vitamin D levels in uh, development of bronchiectasis. That is true. Concomitant presence of COPD may worsen the prognosis. And uh, the in the, the developed countries also, 50 to 60 percent of cases, the etiology of bronchiectasis is still unknown. Okay. Shall I move to the next one? The next question, uh, what symptom is least frequently associated with bronchiectasis? Chronic cough, breathlessness, wheezing, sputum production, hemoptysis. Okay, we'll see the results. Okay, the wheezing. The classic symptoms of the bronchiectasis. So this is the uh, scoreboard. Uh, the Arosha is on top now. The classic clinical features of bronchiectasis is the cough, sputum production, and dyspnea. And there can be a hemoptysis and liquor recurrent pleurisy. The wheezing is not a uh, clinical symptoms of uh, bronchiectasis. Okay. There can be a coexisting asthma, but it is not a typical feature. Okay. Shall we move to the next question? What is the best test to diagnose bronchiectasis? This is very easy. What is the test that you need to diagnose bronchiectasis? Okay, 80% has got it for CT chest. Yeah, for the diagnosis of bronchiectasis, you need uh, the CT chest. So that is enough. For CT features of bronchiectasis, there are three bronchus visualization within one centimeter of the pleural surface, lack of bronchial tapering, and increased bronchoarterial ratio. Uh, depending on these features, bronchiectasis, there is a severity index, so BRICS index. Uh, do, uh, the dilatation and the number of bronchopulmonary segment with emphysema. So you can assess the whether this is a mild disease or a severe disease. Okay. So the next question. These are very easy. Huh? Which of the following accurately define the acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis? So what, what is acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis? So now the time is up. The so answers are okay. Seventy-three percent has voted. Is a so it defined as a deterioration of three or more clinical symptoms for at least forty-eight hours. So that is the acute exacerbation of a bronchiectasis. Right. Next one. Which statement about the distribution of bronchiectasis is incorrect? Mm -hmm. Cystic fibrosis is upper lobe predominant. Uh, so you can answer. Uh, 
time is up. So the correct answer is, I'm asking the incorrect answer actually. So idiopathic bronchiectasis is usually involved in the uh, lower lobes. And in patient with cystic fibrosis is usually upper lobe predominant. And patient with allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is usually central and perihyde area is mostly involved. And middle lobe and uh, lingual lobe involvement usually, uh, so middle lobe and uh, left lingual lobe involvement, we are considered mostly uh, mycobacteria other than TB infections. So this is the scoreboard. Okay, shall we move to the next question? Yeah. Sorry. So this is the etiology of bronchiectasis based on the uh, pattern distribution. If there is a focal uh, bronchiectasis, then always we have to think about so there can be a focal, uh, mural, extramural, or there is a, a localized cause. That is, if it is a, uh, a diffuse distribution, then we have to think about that. If it is upper lobe predominant, it is most probably cystic fibrosis. It is a middle lobe, lingular lobe. It could be due to uh, in, uh, asthma, primary ciliary dyskinesia, like that. If it is a lower lobe predominant, most of the time it is due to idiopathic form, so recurrent aspiration or recurrent respiratory tract infection as well. So this is the next question. Which drug would a patient with bronchiectasis take via a nebulizer? The correct answer is antibiotics and bronchodilators. All of you know, so the we are usually giving bronchodilators via nebulizers, but other than this antibiotic gentamicin nebulization also is prescribed for the bronchiectasis patient. As my uh, sir will discuss later in this talk. So the next one, the what is the best ways or ways to avoid worsening of bronchiectasis? So the correct answer is actually all of these measures can take to reduce the bronchiectasis uh, worsening. So, so according to the uh, the BTS guidelines, so maintain the lung health in bronchiectasis patient. They are advised to avoid lung irritants and always uh, they have to perform these airway clearance therapies. Mucolytic agents like hypertonic saline, mannitol also play a vital role and pulmonary rehabilitation and uh, in, most important thing if there is underlying etiology for the, this bronchiectasis then we have to treat for that as well and if there is a patient presented with the infection we have to treat with antibiotics prompt antibiotics and treatment okay okay uh, so the next question okay the only there are uh, four questions left so if then uh, you also can join if you like. So there's a small QR code you can scan and you can join to the quiz if you like. Okay, the next question is, what conditions can bronchiectasis be occasionally linked to? What are the other associated conditions? You are, I'm giving only 15 seconds to answer this question. For the correct answer is all of these, in, especially the inflammatory bowel disease, the rheumatoid arthritis, Jogren syndrome, and yellow nail syndrome, all these conditions are associated with the uh, bronchiectasis. Okay. Next question. Which complication of bronchiectasis is more prone to causing significant hemoptysis? What is the cause for hemoptysis in patients with bronchiectasis? The answer is the, the correct answer is actually it's 80 percent has marked it correct. So neovascularization of the bronchial arteries is the cause for development of recurrent hemoptysis in patient with uh, bronchiectasis. Okay. Okay. Next time we'll to the next question. Which of the following infection indicate the severe bronchiectasis and suggest a shift deterioration in lung function? The Haemophilus influenza, Moraxella cateri, Pseudomonas, or Staphylococcus aureus. What is the infection? Okay. 
Okay, the correct answer is the pseudomonas infection. If it is pseudomonas is positive, so it is very uh, crucial for this uh, the, the future progression of the disease. So actually, uh, so this is the scoreboard. And so other or any bacterial, most of the time it is bacterial infection, but viral infections are also common among these patients. Common infections are hemophilus influenzae, hemophilus para influenzae, and pseudomonas infections. But other, uh, the typical uh, organisms like streptococcus pneumoniae are like, so those infections are little common, little uncommon in patients with bronchiectasis. So this is the last question. Which statement about the management of infective exacerbation of bronchiectasis is incorrect? The correct answer is the prior antibiotic sensitive pattern should always be considered when you are managing this patient when presented to the uh, so the, the the infective exacerbation. So I'm asking the incorrect answer. And always, so we have to encourage the patient to do the uh, airway clearance techniques, which will facilitate the recovery. Another thing, um, exacerbation of bronchiectasis can be triggered by respiratory viruses as well. All patients should undergo uh, cultures before antibiotics, that is also true. And uh, usually antibiotic duration for the bronchiectasis exacerbation is 10 to 14 days duration, usually. Okay. So so this is the scoreboard. So, actually, so Arusha has uh, done some excellent work. So anyway, so thank you for others for participating. So anyway, so you don't have to worry because the most important and the, the, the important topics will be discussed by my, my mentor. Uh, I will cordially invite Dr. Ashant Perera, uh, sir, to deliver her topic on uh, management of uh, bronchiectasis. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Colin and uh, Hironi, for the excellent presentations on the MCQ and the and the, the case presentations. As, as Hironi said, the uh, bronchitis is also a very important uh, topic. Uh, com uh, presentation of patient day to day uh, medical respiratory patients in, into the hospitals, and uh, it's, so therefore it's an emerging health problem globally, and also it's a progressive respiratory disease, and it's likely to be under recognized because initially maybe diagnosed with other conditions like asthma and COPD, and when unless people tend to uh, clinically evaluate and uh, do the x-rays and the CDs and all. And they may miss it as uh, just observatory airway diseases because of the chronic cough and uh, the SOB. And it affects people across a spectrum of age, mainly in females over 60 years of age. And it, in the lungs, it is characterized by permanent dilatation of bronchi and uh, it presents with clinically uh, with cough sputum production, which may be viscous, purulent, or of, of higher volume, with recurrent respiratory tract infections, and uh, also, once established, may lead to gradual decline in lung function. So, uh, day by day, and then we try it, we tend to recognize the disease entities not like a single entity. When you talk about ILD, it's not a single entity. When you talk about asthma, so it's not a single entity. But so the same way, uh, with the investigations and with uh, more information coming up, and people have recognized that it is a highly heterogeneous disorder. When there is no typical bronchitis patient, one patient may be different from another patient. 
it's due to various various uh, factors because of the underlying causes are different comorbidities of these patients are different the lung and functions are different and radiology also they are atypical uh, uh, involvement is also different the microbiology may be different maybe starting with uh, the viruses the bacteria the fungi and the mycobacteria and so on and this is severity also different from one person to the other person and the the treatment adherence and other 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 factors also different from patient to patient but common to all there are four key aspects to the pathophysiology there is a cycle of infection there is an inflammation ongoing and dysfunctional mucociliary clearance and there is a structural damage so what are the causes and associations there may be the idiopathic ones, the immune deficiencies, the connective tissue and inflammatory disorders, or the, or the mechanical obstructions. The aspiration uh, may cause, and there are, there are other rare conditions as well, but the foreign bodies and uh, the intrabronchial tumors and extensive compressions due to uh, uh, the local mass lesion or uh, lymph nodes, maybe, and the uh, ILDs and also. Uh, previous TB fibrosis and uh, CTDs and lately found as CTDs. And I realized when, when I collected data of our bronchitis disease patient, many of our patients also were having rheumatoid factor positivity and, uh, and various other the immunological uh, deficiencies, congenital ones also may be contributing to that. And uh, on top of acid, uh, the infections play a role. And sometimes when you start investigating and investigating, I remember all the respective people maybe have come, come across these conditions. I remember one of these patients who have been going on when I was a junior consultant in Anuradhapura. And uh, uh, a young girl of 17 years of age, recurrent infections, recurrent pneumonias, gone through lots of peds, and finally, in the adulthood, came to us under a physician, and one of the physicians referred to me. And we, that was the time we first got the facility of having a CT, and it was when we did the CT, it was uh, the tip of a, uh, we remember we had school goes and uh, the university students, those say we had this one particular pen called Porex pen with a metal tip. And that was the metal tip, it has gone inside and blocked the thing. And going back through my SR days also, we had another two patients, again the same scenario of a same pen, the metal tip, going and dislodging in a, one of the bronchus and causing bronchiectasis. And finally, the whole segments were taken out by the surgeons. So importance of infections in bronchiectasis. And there are many associations Bronchiectasis may be, as well as may be uh, considered as due to uh, prior infections or persistent lung infection may be the hallmark of bronchiectasis as well because they, are, they may be polymicrobial and complex and challenging to treat because some of, these, some of the infections are not really infections, they are just the colonizers only. But when you culture the organisms on the sputa and it will yield a positive culture, that does not mean all the positive cultures of uh, uh, my MTM or mycobacteria or that's not MTM, why not my, my, my non-tuberculous non mycobacteria and the bacteria, whether you need to treat or not, whether it's a colonizer or not, whether it has quite out causing a lung damage that has to be uh, decided. So uh, the infections have wide ranges of outcome, but frequent exacerbations with infections will lead to a uh, progressive decline in lung function as well. The most common bacteria are the pseudomonas and the hemophilus, the gram-negative ones, and there are the Morexella and Enterobacteria and the gram-positives as well. And also, we may co-detect aerobic and non-anaerobic species as well. Unfortunately, we don't have the facilities to check for the anaerobes. And as I said, there is a higher incidence of NTM, that is non tuberculous mycobacteria colonizations that has been noted in various studies as well. And mm -hmm. in the good old days, they described this syndrome called the Lady Wintermeyer syndrome, which where the NTM has a predilection for the 
uh, the <clears throat> the lingual lobe of the left upper lobe and the right middle lobe uh, where the Shakespeare uh, uh, drama uh, uh, term has been used as the lady in the syndrome. And NTMs are characterized by uh, bronchiectasis and pulmonary infiltrates and nodules on HRCT, and they may be associated with progressive disease. As I said earlier, not all the NTMs need, need to be treated with antimicrobials. So when it comes to management of bronchiectasis, you need to treat any underlying disease. As I said, if the foreign body is causing the problem, you have to treat that and you have to remove that. And you need to treat the associated bronchospasm, as uh, Dr. Halna said earlier. Some of the patients may have bronchospasms, and we, although the wheezing is not the not the typical feature of a bronchiectasis, but some of them are having bronchiectasis with the bronch bronchospasm asthma presentations. And you need to prevent recurrent lung infections. You need to remove the excess mucus that is produced by different means, and also prevent exacerbations by uh, by these means plus uh, offering them prophylactic measures. So, so in the medical, medical management, management, you have a medical management, medical sometimes you have a surgical management of bronchiectasis as well. In the medical, medical management, you have to confirm the diagnosis as bronchiectasis and evaluate for underlying disorders for treatable conditions. And also, you need to have a multimodality approach to care, which is personalized to the individual patient. So his in 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 the, these day to day, we talk about precision medicine where you tailor made the treatment plans for individual patients. Bronchitis is one disease where you need to have a kind of a program where you decide the, the treatment strategy for the patient characteristics, the specific pathogens and the genetics and the response to therapies we're considering. So in the stepwise approach, you confirm the diagnosis and disease the underlying cause, as I said, and attention is given to general clinical care, the nutrition, the healthy lifestyles, the vaccinations, the oral hygiene, and airway clearance therapies and anti-inflammatory therapies, maintaining and maintenance antibiotics if required for uh, uh, to, to keep the uh, the bacteria colonized in check. And you need to, of course, treat the exacerbations. In the confirmation of the diagnosis, in the clinical evaluation, you do the symptom evaluation. It's very important to consider the age of onset and the duration of the condition. Now, the two cases we presented, the two are two different. Now, why somebody presenting with bronchitis at a young age and uh, very young as a child do? Or as, a, or as a teenager, or else as an older woman, how, why, why, what are the causes which has caused this? We have to think about it. So, so the depth you are investigating is different depending on the age and the problems they are associated with. Whether there is a family history of bronchitis and past and recurrent infections, whether the child has had uh, infections like coughing cough and other viral infections, which may block the tiny bronchioles or bronchi during childhood with the mucus. And you know, when they hyper breathe, they get dried up and they get plugged. The, 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 the main bronchi or the branching bronchi may get plugged. And the frequency of exacerbation, the respiratory failures, and some many of the older people who are with us who get admitted, they are in respiratory failure. So we need to do this clinical evaluation. And during the investigative evaluation and the clinical evaluation, where we have two parts, in the clinical evaluation, you go for the severity assessment also. It's very worthwhile doing it. There are two scores developed, phase score and bronchiectasis severity index, or BSI. In the phase score, you consider the lung function as FEV1, the age of presenting, the chronic colonizations, whether it's a colonization or not, the extension of the disease, how many lobes are affected, the, the degree of dyspnea on an MMRC scale, they count and add on to a uh, kind of a scoring system in the whether it is to mild, moderate, or severe bronchitis. In the bronchitis severity index, similar things 
plus the number of hospital admiss admissions, whether the CV exacerbation in the past two years, number of exacerbation in the year, and whether this is colonized by the pseudomonas or other organisms, and the radiological severity all will be added on to uh, uh, tallying into mild, moderate, or severe bronchiectasis. However, the severe uh, the severity scores, uh, although it gives a future risk, some idea about the future risk, but do not identify the patients who are likely to develop specific treatment we will need that will not be uh, given by the severity tools. In the investigative evaluation, there are many guidelines recommended, but uh, they recommend a routine bundle of tests for a patient newly diagnosed with bronchitis. But as I said earlier, Depending on the patient's history, the age of onset, the severity, we may not go for all. For example, an older woman presented with bronchiectasis, having it possibly after TB, you don't go into the depths of uh, analyzing for the, uh, the inborn errors in the immunity. Whereas a child who is presenting in the uh, early childhood, we may go ahead with 10 and go look for these things. At the same time, history is very important in a child, especially, especially whether there's possibility of aspiration of some foreign objective and swallowing, and they may not remember those things, uh, but that history has to be considered properly. Basic and advanced tests, which are tailor-made, are important, as I said, depending, depending on the, uh, the disease types. In the basic bundle, chest X-rays and X-ray of the sinuses are important because sinuses and bronchitis with the mucociliary clearance defects, as in cardiac syndrome, dextrocardia, and kind of things, they are very important to uh, do the chest X-ray. In addition, you have to have a, a sinus X-ray also. And also, advanced radiology like HRCT is very important, as uh, Dr. Kalina also explained, the bronchitis bronchial versus the artery ratio more than one. That is the bronchus becoming more dilated than the artery. The accompanying bronchial, bronchial artery is important to assess the degree of bronchitis. The absence of bronchial tapering in the last one third and the visualization of peripheral bronchi in the last one centimeter is causal pleural margin and peribronchial thickening, mucus plugging, and mosaic patterns because of the obstructed and non obstructed uh, airways having different attenuation on CT, one with a kind of a haziness, one is more darker, so will uh, contribute to a kind of a mosaic pattern in the CT. CT also gives a kind of a uh, assessment of index score, like as I said, as Kalna said earlier, a brick score the bronchial dilatation and the number of bronchopulmonary segments with emphysema are added up together to cause, I mean, I mean to uh, stratify them into mild, moderate, and severe disease. And mild is just, just the lumen of the bronchus is just more than the, uh, the accompanying vessel. And if it is more than two to three times of the vessel, it is moderate and severe is more than three times. Okay, coming to microbiological tests, very important in uh, after the imaging, this is also out of the basic bundle, it is very important to do the microbiology, the sputum bacterial cultures, if facilities available for anaerobics as well, the sputum direct smears, the AB culture, the gene expert, and the mantus are important in these patients. And the Evaluate the extent of infection, very important. How do you evaluate? Now, just because you've got a culture positivity, that does not mean these patients are having an infection which is contributing to the present state. More, many of these patients are having yellow sputum, but when you culture, they may give a, a positive culture yield. But the CBs, the, the complete blood counts, the inflammatory markers, and comparison of the check stress success on the CTs of the past with the present will give you a clue whether it's really infection or a, just a colonization. And, uh, and when you want a, a direct sampling and to direct visualization, we may go ahead with a bronchoscopy, fibrotic bronchoscopy, rolling out 
other causes also like the endobronchial lesions, the endobronchial foreign bodies, and the, uh, you can see the pus coming when you do the washings. And we can take the sample for the full reports, the gene expert, the bacteria, fungal, and A, B cultures. And the, you can do the brushings and, uh, and the galactoman and antigens as well. So pulmonary function tests also important. These patients may have a mix of obstructive and respiratory functional patterns because if it is associated with fibrosis, there may be an obstructive pattern as well. And with the bronchospasms, the obstructive as well. Uh, out of the usual bundle of investigation, the, these are the specific ones we would consider. Like when you when a person, when the patient presents in the childhood, you or the young age groups, looking for the specific immunoglobulin deficiencies like uh, IgG, AM, or M, or whether there is a total IgE elevation, whether then there is an inflammatory response with that as well. If there's a Elevated IgE when you go ahead with the aspergillus specific investigations as well with aspergillus specific IgE for the uh, the ABPS and also IgG aspergillus specific IgG for the chronic aspergillus infections. You may go ahead with the student uh, sorry uh, skin prick test for the aspergillus antigens and the specific antigens also galactoman and antigens as well. As I earlier said. Some of these older patients may require the screening for immunological based other conditions like CTDs with rheumatoid factor, anti CCPs, and ANS. And serum complement three and four levels, again, the specific immune deficiencies, and also nitroblue tetrasolium test or NBT test for uh, it's a blood test for neutrophil functions. It is done at the MRI. And also, so flow cytometry analyzed the immune cell populations deficiencies like in T or B or NK cells. And also, we can test the humoral immunity deficiencies by uh, two specific antigens, like uh, using the pneumococcal antigens or H influenza B or tetanus antigens. Or here at MRI, uh, Dr. Rajiv Disila used the post typhoid V1 vaccination as well. We vaccinate, give the injection, and after a specific period of time, uh, look for the uh, antibody development, uh, the, whether it is subdue or abnormal or uh, whether okay. Sometimes these patients are having associated conditions like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiencies and also in CFTR duration in cystic fibrosis, and so it chloride test and, and also where facilities available in very specific centers, we can do the electronic microscopy for primary ciliary dyskinesia diseases. When you label, I, it remembers, uh, reminds me of a, a child who had been suspected of having a PCD at the age of uh, infancy, during infancy. Somebody has made a note of that. The child has been later uh, taken by parents to uh, to one of the Middle Eastern countries and lived there for many years. With the label of query PCD, they have been labeling this child for PCD, 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 right along over the next 10, 12 years. And finally, one day she presented to us one of the known contexts of one of the famous music bands. And uh, when you go ahead with all these things, this child was not having PCD, absolutely. Because that was just a, just a red herring like everybody was going through and they were uh, treated at, at uh, Doha in the Middle East. And with and child was so much depressed and self-cornered like and it has ruined total life of this guy, girl. When you talk to her in private and in in very, very personally talk to her, get her motivated. And she had been on all sorts of things in mucus clearance techniques, just with your therapy and kind of all these things. Within three or four months of staying in Sri Lanka uh, for the last year, she improved a lot and she started to put on weight and uh, became very pleasant and started to own other recreational activities. Went back to Doha. 
and with all our writings and why we see said not a pcd and there are no 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 uh, uh, evaluation and kind of things the write ups the american uh, chess physicians and the pediatricians have been treating her have been amazed and they were commenting in vain we did not think about verifying this why we have gone through the some of the diagnosis of it. so when you label somebody in a childhood remember that uh, you should label something because all the write ups of all the di uh, doctors down the line they were said diagnosed child with pcd diagnosed child with child, pcd 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 but nobody has done a she was having perfectly otherwise okay like right then the pharmacological aspects of management is very important. Sometimes when they are present with bronchospasm, you will need the uh, bronchodilators, short acting and long acting. Inhaled cortical series, they are again may be relevant, but you you have to remember this: the uh, bronchiectasis patients are having chronic coughs. Not all these chronic coughs are related to bronchospasm and asthma. This is bronchiectasis. However much you give it total of high inhaled corticosteroids at the highest dose of corticosteroids and even the orals, that will not going to remove this uh, cough. You have to talk to this patient and tell that you look here. This, this is part of your life, this cough, even the sputum production, the yellowness, the change of yellowness and the offensive nature, uh, bleed, infection and change of weight or kind of thing. Maybe different may may suggest an infection rather than the the change the, the it contrary to the the normal way of the patient that has to be uh, uh, communicated to the patient. So, if you are using inhaled corticosteroids with higher dose, it may be more harmful, increasing the rate of pneumonia and non tuberculous mycobacterial infection. I remember as an SR twenty years more than twenty years ago at Valisera. We had a young woman. She was saying, I cannot bear this halitosis. Whenever we give a higher dose of inhaled cortical stretch, she develops this recurrent infections with halitosis and all. So we need to remember increasing the inhaled cortical steroid dose per se or adding just oral cortical steroid will not benefit these patients. They have a, a amount of, I mean, a certain amount of cough and sputum production that will not go off totally. And uh, CCMK series has no, no long-term role, but there are other very important things like the mucolytics, maybe oral, bromexin or anacylocysteine, or nebulized hypertonic saline non manitol may be useful as well. Antibiotic use. You need to optimize the use of antibiotics through a targeted approach, considering, as I said earlier, to differentiate infection versus colonizations, the lung microbiome diversity, and also how to minimize the development of antibiotic resistance. So as Dr. Kalna also earlier said, the previously known culture patterns, whether the, if the patient is known to have bronchiectasis with recurrent pseudomonas infection sensitive to these organisms, these antibiotics, that has to be considered when you are starting empirical treatment uh, for this patient rather than at this time something else. This is the next time another higher antibiotic. That is not the case. Always you need to select the antibiotic very appropriately. So here again, the proper antibody stewardship is very important with the five Ds as key elements, the right drug, the correct dose, the right drug route, the suitable duration and we need to de-escalate to pathogen-directed therapy when, when you are when you're okay with the uh, organism found on the culture. But suppose you have started with one antibiotic, you have sent the culture's pre-treatment. By the time you receive the culture positivity, that antibiotic is not the ones, one which is responding to the grown antibiotic, the, the bacteria. But if the patient is improving clinically, and the cell counts and the immune marker, it's an inflammatory markers, then there's no need to change it to a different antibiotics. You have to think your uh, clinicals. For exacerbations, you may use oral or IV depending on the severity. 
with uh, reasonable coverage, seven to 10 days or 10 to 14 days if it is severe. If very empirical previously known organisms have to be decided, there are a whole range of antibodies we may use, acetromycin, clitrithros, and the cotrim and doxies, levoflux, and gentine and micazine. And coming back to the maintenance antibodies, the prophylactic ones, if it is indicated, it is indicated if there are frequent exacerbation more than two to three per year, and is targeted for long-term antibiotic strategies. If you are going to start, you need to think about, you have to take a decision. And so you have suggested the oral ones like amoxicillin, fluproxin, and trimethoprim, and uh, azathioprim, but I do not know with the, the misuse of antibodies, how many, how much, how many of them will be, can be used as prophylactic antibodies in our Sri Lankan practices. The nebulized ones for, for cystic fibrosis, the trabromycin and colistin and gentamicin for the other ones are uh, suggested. And consider the macrolide therapy. Uh, they are supported by three clinical trials, or is it remind 500 three times a week, depending on the weight of the patient, and also 250 milligram daily, or erythromycin, uh, erythromycin uh, 400 milligram twice daily. Those are the regimens suggested. The role is <clears throat> they have an uh, antimicrobial effect. In addition, they have immunomodulator properties as well. Uh, because uh, it's known with the uh, the macrolides. But you have to remember the chronic macrolide therapy have other concerns as well. This is there's a potential for disrupting the microbial ecology of the lung, development of the resistance and adverse effects like uh, cardiac arrhythmias and hearing losses from the long-term usage of these things. And also macrolide monotherapy is contraindicated if you are... Uh, if the patient is co-infected with non-tuberculous mycobacteria, because one of the mainstays of uh, uh, NTM therapies in, is, will be long-term metabolites. Uh, when it comes to inhaled therapies for bronchiectasis, we may use bronchodilators and inhaled antibiotics and the sputum clearing agents as well. And the advantage is the inhaled medications are targeting the airways more effectively and directly. Inhaled antibodies uh, are concerned with pseudomonas infection, gentamicin, tobramycin, and ciprofloxacin. As tripod inhalers, others may be for nebulized solutions and also polystyrene. For non-TM NTM infections, non-typical bacteria, refer not all NTM infections will need antibiotic treatments because you need to consider whether it's an invasive NTM or not and considering there are ways of considering the clinical and the radiology and the other inflammatory markers. And the uh, treatment is warranted if the organism persisting and causing lung damage when symptoms. <clears throat> symptoms like even hemoptysis, recurrent hemoptysis, and many of them are co-associated with fungal infections as well. The most common NTMs are the MAC group and the m abscesses Clarithrofiamphazine and ethambutol may be used, usually continue until the cultures are negative for 12 months, generally for 18, 24 months will take. So that kind of a longer treatment of with microbiology and some macrolides, we can have the problems. Very importantly, airway clearance techniques are important, like uh, mucolytics, oral or nebulized, the expectorants and the hydrations are very important in these patients because most of these patients are hyperventilating. They're not taking adequate amount of food because of their, their main concern will be breathing. And uh, the clearance techniques and devices are also developed with various gadgets and techniques are uh, employed. When considered their techniques, uh, chest physiotherapy by clapping on the chest by the respiratory chest of therapist, or there are electronic chest clappers or vests that are uh, that have come into the market. And there are breathing techniques also to move out the mucus into the upper airways from the lower down, uh, like uh, forced expiratory techniques and also active cyclic breathing techniques. And also there are devices like uh, oscillating positive uh, expiratory pressure devices and intrapulmonary percussion ventilation devices. And these are uh, uh, getting being or being introduced to the Sri Lankan markets as well, but many of the other countries are having even inclu including in India. Very importantly, the next important thing is the prevention of infection. I've already discussed about the antibiotics. 
but the oral hygiene of this patient opening the eye the the mouth oral cavity and looking have opened the mouth and looking at their oral whether they are using beetle chewing and the decayed teeth getting them attended by the dental surgeons and uh, then the dental washers and so on and also regular immunization with the pneumococcal and influenza influenza once in a once a year the viral influenza one the pneumococcal maybe early we used to vaccinate with five yearly now there are data to say once 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 in a life maybe maybe enough but there are things Confirmation of the past immunizations of pertussis and measles for a child is important as well if they are getting recurrent infections. Very important uh, point is nutrition and hydration. When you look at all these patients and who are getting admitted to, uh, to the wards, at a distance you can say this is a bronchitis patient, especially an older female who is very thin built, nutritional deficient, and uh, at a distance you can say they are, they are, they are there are problems of protein and energy malnutrition and hematine deficiency and reduced bone mineral density and poor intake, the catabolism increase, the protein losses with the sputum production, the anemia of chronic disorders all contribute to the, all this thing. And they are hypoxic because of the lung damage and they all contribute to the increased catabolism. Vitamin D supplementation may have a role in OAD exacerbation in these patients, but uh, with the direct role is there for bronchitis patient is uh, something to, uh, there are no data fully available. But anyway, many of these patients are vitamin D deficient as well because of the in intake issues. Fine. The management of underlying the, our associated disorders is very important. Protein smoking, very important. Some of these Rare diseases we may need the IVIGs and 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 flan anti deficiency treatments and CF patient treatments and with recombinant nebul DNS nebulizations and also treatment of associated CTDs may be important. And since it, uh, when they are hypoxic in respiratory failure, we may have to consider domiciliary long term oxygen therapy and uh, to reduce the because there is a reduced oxygen supply versus the raised demand of the breathing. And uh, we have to consider them uh, going analyzing them through going through their uh, the clinical paths. Surgical options, do they have a role in uh, uh, surgery? Going back to our case, two patients who have undergone VETS to biopsy, I am not agreeing with that one. Why you go for a biopsy for a patient who is having a, a bronchic disease? I guess that patient had been initially presented to the surgical part and they may have done the biopsy and nothing found there. But local resection remains uh, an op option for localized disease, especially uh, somebody who has had a foreign body associated bronchiectasis, as I said earlier, as a, a teenage girl. And also I have had a patient who had uh, uh, right middle lobe syndrome with recurrent bronchiectasis. That was one of my earliest case of as a young young chest physician who got, he had to motivate the surgeons to get the lung out of a, of a one, one lobe out. But uh, also it is indicated from bronchitis related to NTM resistant to medical management. And the importance is there is a spillover of uh, infected material to the rest of the lung and the lung that the affected lobe may not be contributing enough to the, the breathing of the patient already damaged. There is nothing much to contribute. Taking it out may be useful for this patient. But there again, the patient is having associated COPD and uh, re, I mean uh, uh, reduced lung capacity. You need to, before you take a lung out, you need to do a sort of number of calculations whether the removal of a segment or two, whether it's going to harm the patient's lung capacity that has to be assessed clinically by the the physicians and the and the and the anesthetic team together with the surgeons. Telehealth and remote monitoring has come to uh, management of his chronic lung disease in the various other parts of the world as well. So, as I in 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 collectively management of uh, uh, bronchitis is a collaborative or comprehensive care 
involved in the pulmonologies, physiotherapies, the surgeons, and the, and the respiratory therapists, and the nutritionists, and so on, and the microbiologists. So looking for the future, there are new therapies have come for uh, uh, aiming at neutrophil targeting the neutrophilic inflammation. There are various studies going on. Various drugs are coming to trials as well. Not going to detail, but recombinant uh, DNAs, uh, human DNAs, has been has been uh, been used as in I mean uh, we coming with handily to help to degrade the biofilms which have been uh, produced by the degrading cells and uh, the we are, the bacterial colonization is going to be very much and statins also have to be uh, known to be having a, a role in uh, controlling the neutrophilic inflammation and there are novel antibiotics as well come into light and phage therapy has been also introduced so finally uh, in summary Bronchiectasis is a global health issue. It's a highly heterogeneous disorder with a major challenge for management. There are many infections involved in the, its causation and many infections are involved in the exacerbations. And uh, care is a personalized, multimodal approach uh, for these patients uh, and uh, deciding on their individual basis. And there are a few promising novel therapeutics agents in the horizon. And thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, we are ready to take any questions from the audience or uh, those of you joining us online. Any questions that you have for the speakers? Uh, those of you in the audience, please raise your hand and we will bring over the microphone. Yeah. Oh, Very chronic uh, right sinusitis, having post nasal drip and having early bronchiectasis, and I just wonder whether this uh, the idiopathic group. The, whether there is a significant proportion of them has uh, chronic chronosynthesis and then having post nasal drip. What is your experience on that? Yeah. Uh, good question. That's also one of my observations as well. I have not thought about why it has there is a pulsation like in a, a cardiac syndrome or a, or a extracardiac patient. But maybe they may have kind of a mucociliary or maybe it's kind of a, a mucus clearance problem. May not be the mucociliary uh, layer with it due to uh, any uh, un unidentified cause that I do not know. But you have this, 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 this. And uh, or oh, whether it's just an association or just an observation that we also don't know because we have we are a country with a higher proportion of asthma and rhinitis as well. If you ask anybody, 
they be, they do having uh, most of them are having at least a little bit of we see no rhinitis like episodes so they suggest an observation or association for so somebody has to think about yes. Actually, you really know, do you think that that uh, lobectomy was rather delayed or what do you think? Uh, this is the second case, I think. It's just rather delayed because uh, the patient suffered several times the lobectomy, but she was not willing for lobectomy at first. That caused for her to undergo several BAs. Could I have actually diagnosed TB in the prior episode if we had performed the dentary prior? It's still rather delayed. I think, yeah, that is the reason that I wanted to highlight as well, because most of these patients are reluctant to go for the most appropriate treatment, even if it is available for these patients. Uh, and what we see is that, especially the segmental bronchiectasis, sometimes post-tuberculosis bronchiectasis, having uh, these infections, and, uh, it's right. and uh, then they get uh, recurrent infections there, and then the other type, other part of the lungs are also damaged. And sometimes it is too late, and sometimes they get different uh, hemoptysis as well. And also, uh, why some people are getting a kind of a not that great bronchiectasis? Some people are getting the cylindrical, just a cylindrical bronchitis, and some of them are having kind of a very profuse, secular kind of a bronchiectasis with like uh, lots of collections. Yet to know. What the cause is, whether it's due to the anatomy of the lung or the organisms causing or the age of onset. Uh, one of the messages I would like to give those who are with the peeps who are listening or joining and uh, getting somebody is having recurrent infections or recurrent coughs, it's worthwhile doing a chest x ray. That's the delaying a chest x ray is a problem in this country. That is the same problem with uh, TB diagnosing the pediatric age group as well. So, um, I, want to, um, I want to ask regarding acetromycin. The dose actually, you have put uh, like uh, acetromycin 500 uh, uh, day, uh, every other day, like three times a week or 250 daily. Yeah. But commonly, we practice practice 250 every other day most of the time is uh, what is the background data and what is the explanation but, 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 so that is probably the data will come yes, from to the european and the big net people maybe the antibiotic dosage but uh, maybe i did not find uh, 250 commonly used 250 every other day so maybe that uh, still although the guidelines says that we haven't used it 500 daily Yes, sir. Thank you. We don't have any questions on the chat. So, if anybody else in the audience would like to ask anything, so if not, uh, we'll conclude the meeting. And uh, before we conclude, we have a small letter of appreciation to our speakers. On behalf of the SLMA, I invite Dr. Senit Peramuna, Council Member of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, to present these to our speakers. If you would do the honor, sir. Um, first, Dr. Ishan Perra, Consultant Respiratory Physician, NHRD, Valley Sarat. Dr. Hiruni Nimesha, Senior Registrar in Respiratory Medicine, NHRD, Bansara. And finally, Dr. Kalani Jayavira, Senior Registrar in Respiratory Medicine from the NHRD, Bansara. Thank you, Dr. Senith, and thank you to all our speakers, and especially the College of Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists for having our fourth monthly clinical meeting for the month of April. We hope to see you all at the fifth monthly clinical meeting, which will be held in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists, and this will be held on 28th May, 2024. Thank you for your presence, and thank you all for joining online and in person. We will see you next time.
Thank you.